the heck do we have a lawyer in this room? I take it that most of you are mathematicians, um, computer scientists working in industry, in the academia, perhaps some technicians. Um, and why, why a lawyer? What has a lawyer got to say in the realm of artificial intelligence? Well, our perception, or my perception as a lawyer, of course, is that you technological people, you seem to focus always on the thing. You're interested in how to do it, how to construct it, and does it work, or doesn't it? The other aspect, what does it do to people? Well, you also talk about it, but mostly in terms of, like Google does, we have tested on a million people, and that's what people prefer. Therefore, it must be good. But is that really what society is about? Um, it has been said that there are symbolic values that play a great role in our society, how we glue together, how we make sense out of the world, how we understand each other. And it's more or less that meaning, that aspect of how do people react? What does technology do to us? And not what does technology do, which is the center of the ethics. Certainly we hear more about it. And then transposed ethics, that is legal regulation. Now AI, that's something everybody understands. We all know it's totally misleading, but that's a catch word. Once we hear artificial intelligence, that raises certain expectations, expectations which go back in history. And that's why, please accept me, let me start with two preliminary remarks before I just explain what the law does, can do, hopes to do, with regard to one particular example, and that will be liability for damages. Lots of other issues in law we can talk about, but I'll focus on liability, because liability has to do with the autonomy of the AI components, by the way, be they software agents or be they robots. For me, as a layperson, that's basically the same thing because robots is also software driven as the same way as a software appliance that runs only via the net is software driven. So basically, we encounter the same uh, problems. The two preliminary marks are uh, the following. Uh, the date of uh, Isaac Asimov was mentioned somewhere in the 40s. Of course, the dream of artificial intelligence goes back much further. Religious scholars, scholars in religious science will tell you that the whole myth of creation as enshrined and described in all foundation mythologies of all uh, religions basically has to, or deals with the question, how can it be that lifeless material at some point in term has this qualitative flip and turns into something which we call life. How could that be? And once you describe that, of course, the next question was, could we do the same thing, we humans? And of course, um, you have lots of very precise um, uh, uh, monsters, so to speak, or artificial intelligence uh, uh, persons in the old traditions and the old stories. I think one of the most powerful uh, ones is the golem of the 13th century, who was then the major history was, was located in the 16th century in Prague. It's a, a, a creation, has lots to do with the Jewish Kabbalah, how to turn text into life, alchemistry in laws in the background. Um, and it was reported and written down only at the turn of the 18th to the 19th century. And that's the time of Romanticism. Romanticism, for the first time, is a, can be seen as a counter-movement and against the rational Enlightenment period. The, ra the ra Romanticist people basically kind of had as their impetus to say that there is something more than just rational behavior replace rational by technological, then we arrive at today's uh, uh, point. Um, the golem is one person. Uh, Frankenstein's monster, 1818, is another one. We still know that, although to my utter surprise, I found out that Frankenstein is not the name of the monster. It's the name of the creator. Nevertheless, somehow there was a flip in, in, in change, and, and we now call refer to the monster as Frankenstein's. And finally, uh, even still a bit earlier, 1769, von Kempelen's famous chess automaton. I don't know whether you saw it. The chess uh, uh, automaton, for my purpose and my understanding, is really key to our understanding of artificial in intelligence in several respects. Because before 
we had this chess automaton, people thought that if we can create a chess automaton, then we have solved the riddle how to bring dead material into life. And here comes von Kempel and he presents such a machine. And he travels from court to court all over Europe, even to the States. And it works. And people didn't find out till at some point in time, the story goes that there was a fire alarm and von Kempel opened the door of the box and Surprise, surprise, there was a human chess player inside. But the story was, was there. And this shows several things. The first thing is that, of course, um, the movable frontier definition of artificial intelligence. It seems to be intelligent, artificially intelligent, as long as we think that the machines can do it. Once the machines can do it, we probably think it's no longer intelligent. Are we really upset as human beings by the true and working von Kempel and Chess Automaton? Was it Big Big Blue, was it named, who bet Karparov uh, uh, in, the, in the chess game? You can buy a chess automaton for some 50 euros, dollars, or even less in each supermarket store, which would probably beat most of us, unless you're a chess champion. And we are not at all intrigued. We think this is still a dump machine. Probably most people would even think that real speech recognition, translation, automated voice, well, it's something which has been programmed, so what? So that's one point in time. The other point I want to focus on, because that makes the bridge to, to the law, is Frankenstein and Golem. They have both an enabling and a threatening side to them. Frankenstein is the monster that runs around. The Golem, as well, at some time, runs amok and kills people. And the question is, how could this, these, how could these side effects, the unforeseen consequences, how could they be avoided? By the way, both of them can also be seen as precursors. Frankenstein is, of course, a genetic engineering model, and the golem is actually the computer model. It worked with hardware, the clay figure, and you had to put a little piece of paper under his tongue on which something had been written, and then the movement would start. Now, that's perfectly the computer and the computer program. But something is eerie about it, and people were never quite sure. Ultimately, it leads to the destruction of both these automatons. Is that something we want? And that is what brings me to law. And to my utter surprise, I discovered that probably law is not, not, not so much a rational problem solver, but in a way, it could also be described as the magic words, similar to the ones written on the slip of paper for the golem, which try to ban the dangers that might come out of artificial intelligence. Let's not forget, law itself doesn't change reality. It's only rules about shell and ought. It refers to the future and tries to command people to do, certain, uh, to do certain acts. Now, as I said, I won't talk about the plethora of ethical issues from the self-driving cars. If there are two people, one or the other, to be killed, uh, and there is no third alternative, which one should be killed? Uh, should war drones be, uh, be banned? Um, to what extent should learning algorithms be used to control society, such as has been uh, dealt with in the digital uh, manifesto. I'm not talking about these things. I want to focus on liability, liability for damages. And just to briefly uh, uh, mention uh, kind of six, six little points to kind of set the framework uh, so that you better understand how lawyers think and how lawyers would approach the problem. Um, the main reason of the law is basically to adhere and to implement normative values. We want to save human life. We do not want people to get injured. Let's just leave it at that. We want to safeguard human dignity, whatever that means. But that's what we want. That's the normative aspect and the legal rules that kind of command people, thou shall or thou shalt not, you ought to do this, are all designed around this, uh, the implementation of these and safeguards of these normative values in uh, societal interactions. Now, the problem is, of course, that, and that's my second point already, um, traditionally people think that the law is about creating justice. Now, what is justice in the realm, let's say, the speech recognition example that was described to us with regard to people that are blind or cannot hear? Would they need a keyboard? Wouldn't they need a keyboard? And all these intricate questions, is that about justice? Well, I would say justice is far too big a word to describe it in these terms. Technicians and engineers often tell me I'm coming from the KIT, the 
Institute of Technology tell me that, well, you're lousy people, you lawyers. You always kind of make us stop things, things that work and things we think work perfectly and will probably help human mankind. And you come up and tell them you can't do this for reasons of privacy, data protection, or what have you. And the, model, the more modern approach or the answer of the lawyer would then be, oh, wait a minute, we don't forbid certain actions and ban certain actions just out of fun. Why, if we say no, you cannot employ a particular device under particular circumstances, the only reason to do is because we do this in order to save some other person's freedom. So basically, legal rules which kind of draw the line between what you can do and what you are not allowed to do or not supposed to do, they draw the line between two conflicting freedoms. The freedom of Google to make as much profit as possible by whatever kind of products, and I generalize a little bit, on the other side, the freedom of our, all ourselves to have some sort of privacy guaranteed. So the whole question of how to design the rules is one about where do you draw the line? Do you draw it more on the left, more on the right? Do you kind of cut back a little bit on the freedom to act? Or do you give more room for that rearm and the area that should be uh, protected? And at the same time, of course, legal rules can also enable. You could specifically allow certain things. You could have supporting programs, subsidies, research programs, and, and uh, whatever. Um, liability. Liability are classically, uh, my fourth point, liability uh, has traditionally been a liability for faulty behavior. If you behave either with intent or negligently and you cause damage, then you should kind of reimburse and make good the person that you infringed. If I inadvertently drive into your car, I have to pay so that you can repair your car. Very simple idea, but what's behind it? Behind it is the idea of an autonomous human being that can take decisions, that can obey certain duties, can fulfill certain duties, and if that person doesn't, then of course that person has to pay and be responsible for the damage. It's in a way a risk allocation who should pay once the damage has occurred? Should it be the person whose object has been damaged or should it be the person damaging uh, the object? Now, we found out later on that for societal purposes, we need certain systems of telecommunications, mobility, etc., such as trains, cars, airplanes, nuclear power plants, and a couple more, where we could not act on the way of just asking for faulty behavior because that would have been also uh, put uh, too much a burden of proof on those people injured. You see that classically someone dies of cancer who lived for 10 years next to a nuclear power plant. It's virtually impossible for that person to prove that his cancer or her cancer was caused by the nuclear power plant. So the idea was invented that there should be some sort of strict liability. And the idea is it's a liability without fault. You have to be compen you have to be you're under an obligation to compensate certain um, certain damages just because you operate an inherently dangerous uh, technical device, and in order to let it not go through the roof, there is usually a cap on the amount of damages to be paid. You know that when you read the small print on the back of your plane ticket, it says in case you fall down and uh, whatever happens, the maximum amount of damages you can ask for is $50,000. That's much less than you, your court would give you if someone would run you over by fault or would kill you um, otherwise uh, uh, on, the, on the street without, uh, without using a car, without um, an, an, a train or, or an airplane. Um, so the question is, um, and of course the, 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 the third component uh, which plays a major role in there is we kind of um, make sure that the money is there uh, by way of insurance. So the insurance system completes the risk allocation and that means basically via the premiums those people who use the system and take benefit out of the system ultimately via the insurance premium cover up for the damages that result from the system. It's a very rough description, but that's the basic idea. And here comes now the point uh, where does that law, is that law with a combination of liability for fault and um, uh, strict liability, is that 
applicable and is that still appropriate for artificial intelligence? Now, some people say, well, it can't be because artificial intelligence devices, robots, for example, they are intelligent. So they are more like human people and we need some legal personality of a robot. Would that really help? Isn't that too short, Isn't that too short a jump, so to speak? Um, because what would happen if we'd had a robot personality, well, where would that robot personality get the money from to reimburse people it has inadvertently damaged? So we would have to have to set up a certain fund, probably coupled again with insurance, and the question is, don't we get uh, to this uh, uh, result in another way? And my personal answer here would be that there are lots of proposed, supposedly um, intelligent applications and robots which basically, if we look at them from a certain historic distance, are still more or less machines. And in this respect, we could still work with our traditional liability for fault, coupled with lots of specialized duties of care. And uh, for example, there's a duty to supervise, there's a duty to supervise how your product performs on the market, all these recalls of cars for faulty behavior, even of interacting in certain street conditions. It's not only the fault of the car, it also has to do with the street condition, but yet there's a duty of the manufacturer of the cars to recall, to recall the, uh, the cars. And that would be for single robots, that would be the case. Now, last question, what about those robots that interact? Where in the end, if two robots interact, third person gets damaged and infringed, you do not know where exactly did the fault reside, and you cannot find out because your neural networks, when you try to train them or look at them and have them run a second time, they perform already differently because of self-learning than they performed before. What do you do then? And the question and the answer, possible answer, and submit that to discussion is we might go for a strict liability for those who participate in operating the system. Now, the only question is who is part of the system? Self-driving cars, that might be easier. It's a producer, it's maybe the rental company or the, uh, yeah, the rental company, or it's the personal driver, it's the owner of the car, whatever. But with service robots already, the open boundaries or the outer boundaries of the system to define this, that gets a little bit more difficult. With well, just one example, hopefully I succeeded in giving you some idea how lawyers think and what the stake of the lawyers is in that debate. Thank you very much. <laughs>